Hello everyone, my name is Narin and in this session, let's learn system design for massive multiplayer online game systems like um, PUBG or Call of Duty. These are very few examples, but there are tons of massive multiplayer online gaming services available in these days. So this particular video is recorded or uh, broken into two different videos. The first video talks a lot about client-side architecture. That is the actual game which is installed on your phone, on your Xbox or PC. The second video talks about the server-side architecture. You might be wondering why should I learn about the client-side or the actual game functionality. It is very crucial for you as a backend developer or a system engineer or an architect. You should understand how game functionality works. Um, with that, you will know how uh, frequently we can send the data over the network, how to compress the data, or how to do the interpolation or approximation, and all sort of things. It is very crucial for you to understand the whole system uh, to do the system design. So let's start to learn how the game works. I'm not going to talk a lot about how exactly the game works, but instead I'll tell you, or I will explain you some of the core concepts which will enlighten you on um, how these games work or what are the things which we need to concentrate or um, give much emphasis before we do the system design. So let's know a little bit about how the basic or uh, any game works. Any game will have three different functionality. The first one is the game row, okay? Inside the game row, there are three main functional functionality. So the first one is taking the user input and the second one is updating the state of the game and the third one is rendering the game, okay? So the game loop, which will be keep on working um, in a while loop or infinite, uh, in an infinite loop, will be calling these three functions frequently. So this is the basic structure um, each of these function will have its own complex logic inside of it, okay? Say for example, this particular clip which I'm showing right now could have been designed using Unity framework or Unreal Engine or something like that. What you can see over here is um, like each and everything. Say for example, the player who is running with a gun holding in his hand on a grassland and there is a you know power line, there is a bombs blasting, right? If, if you think, all of these are different, different objects. Um, if you use Unity or Unreal Engine, you don't need to worry a lot about these objects because uh, most of these objects are uh, available in the uh, you know framework or you have to tweak a bit. Um, and these objects are kind of handled by the framework itself. All you need to do is write the code logic or the business logic or the how the game functions. And also you need to um, have the lighting setup or the camera angle and all of these things. Uh, it is much fun to you know, develop games using Unity or Unreal Engine. Um, so what I was trying to say was, um, in this particular clip, you will see a lot of objects and a um, lot of things. And these are all actual objects of a class. Okay, all these particular objects will have a state. So when you take a, a user input from the very first function, which I shown in the game loop, user input uh, will somehow translates or changes the state in the game. Okay, that means that that state means objects state in that particular scene. Okay, or in that particular game session. So everything should be changed. And also the state should be represented on the screen. That's how you will see the game. Okay. And often in multiplayer online games, these states should also um, be replicated to other user because two players are playing uh, from remote locations and these two players should see the same uh, behavior of objects uh, which is happening in that particular session. So you need to replicate these state of every, each and every object in the game back and forth between the players to have a seamless experience. The first and foremost thing before you do the system design for these kind of games is to understand what is the nature of game and how the user is, interact, is going to interact with the game and what type of game it is. Majorly, there are three different kind of games. So the first one is a strategic game and the second one is slow turn games and the third one is first person games. So the strategic games are something like Dota or Civilization 5, 6 kind of games. 
where you have a big scene in which you have an army or you have a lot of uh, tankers who are working or uh, fighting in the war. So if you see, it looks something like this. Actually, these kind of games are kind of um, difficult to design from the app perspective or the game perspective. But from the backend perspective, it is a lot easier compared to any other kind of games because all of these are just, you know, all these objects or tankers or the army are just playing on the scene, right? There is no real interaction happening in a real time, um, which complicates the backend system design. Okay. And the second type is, um, you know, turn based game or slow turn game in which uh, the, the good example is, for example, chess or poker. In this, uh, say, uh, this clip, if you see the poker game, there are like uh, four different uh, people who are playing this po poker game, right? So, uh, if you understand this game, every person has uh, their own uh, you know, scheduled time to play the game. That means that the game will be keep on shifting from uh, person one or player one to player two, player three and player four. There is no conflicting or you know race condition or some kind of conflict between two three players input because the inputs are properly um, scheduled. Okay, first player one will play, player two will play, and then player three will play, and then player four. So handling the data movement um, is a lot easier, even though all these players are playing from remote location because we know that now we need to get the data from player one, get the data and synchronize it across each and every player from the player to when his turn for the game, get the data from him and then replicate the data to all of the other three different player and save a copy in the server also. So this is kind of easier because you have enough time to get the data from player and to send it to all the other players. It hardly takes about a couple of milliseconds, right? And that's fine, okay? We have, I mean, we can bear that millisecond gap between transition of um, turns from player one to player two and player two to player three. So this is fine. This is still easier to implement from the backend perspective and also from the front end perspective. And the next kind of game is first person games. Uh, the famous ones are these days PUBG or you know CSGO or Call of Duty, etc. right? In these games, the problem is there are like a couple of uh, players who are playing together and there are a lot of real-time interaction happening between the players. Say, for example, player one he is shooting player two, okay? If you shoot now, if he is aiming perfectly at the other person, the other the player should be dead by now, okay? There is only a fraction of you know, uh, time which is left uh, between player one to player two to sync the data, right? So these kind of games are tough to handle. Consider the case of PUBG itself. So initially they will draw 100 people um, onto an island, right? So you need to keep on synchronizing the data or the inputs from all the 100 people and then um, keep on replicating the scene to all the 100 people back or say, uh, player one, consider all the 100 people are standing in a same scene. So if a, if a guy does something, the same thing should happen for all the 100 people who are playing that game. So, so let's understand how these kind of systems are built and what are the problems we are going to face and how do we solve these problems. Now that you learned the difficulties of first player games where sending messages between a couple of players is difficult and we also need to keep the latency minimal. To understand it better, let's go to the core concept of how the latencies are added up in the process of making calls uh, between players to server and server to player. Suppose we want to send a message from San Francisco to New York. A player from San Francisco is trying to send a message to the server in New York. San Francisco and New York is separated by a distance of 4,000 kilometers. We use copper wires or optical fibers to send the information from place to another place, right? It all works in the speed of light, okay? Nothing can travel more than the speed of light, that is 3.3 to 10 power 8 meter per second. Even though light takes 13 milliseconds to reach from San Francisco to New York, that means that there is an inherent latency. We can't send the information you know, lesser than this particular uh, time, that is 30 milliseconds. So what do we do? 
We don't have any other choice other than we make our system uh, you know, resilient. In ideal situation, from San Francisco to New York, it doesn't actually take 4,000 kilometer. This is the shortest path or displacement. But in actual network cables or how the cables are laid out uh, under sea or between cities, it takes even more than for more than 4,000 kilometer. That is, it could be 6,000 kilometer. And also on the way, it should all the package and packets or the data should also go through a lot of routers and repeaters. And these devices need to unpack the packet and check, verify and redirect the packets, right? In that case, they also had a couple of uh, millisecond latency. So it will not be exactly 30 millisecond. It will be a lot greater than 30 millisecond. It could be 20 or it could be 30 millisecond. Suppose in one more example, say player one is trying to, um, player one and player two are trying to play a game and this particular server is helping them out to play the game. Best case is that player one is uh, 50 millisecond uh, away from the server and also player two is kind of 50 millisecond away from the server which is supporting the game. Now, what is the total uh, latency which um, any input from player two um, to replicate it to the player one or any information in the player two to send it back to the player one or any number of other players. So how much time it would take? It is calculated like from the latency which is taken from player two to the server, that is 50 millisecond. And the server should also update the state and do some kind of process. So let's take it takes 100 millisecond on a um, best case. And then it needs to transmit back this particular message, which it received from player two to player one or any number of other players. That will take another 50 millisecond. That means that at least there is 200 millisecond of latency to send the information or the input given by the player two or the state of the player two to any number of other players. In this case, player one. That means that, look at this demo. In this case, the red ball um, represent the player two and the blue ball represent the player one. You know, it at least takes some 200 millisecond delay uh, to send the data from blue ball, uh, the blue player to the red player. So if you see here, the ball moves from the play blue player first and then the ball moves from the red player. That means that there is a little latency. What it shows is when we are playing the online games, we can't replicate the state of other players to any given player in real time. There is always a little latency. If I press an up arrow and my player will, or my game, game character will jump uh, on my screen immediately, but it will take 200 millisecond for my character to jump on any of the other players who are playing with me. So there is an inherent latency. So now we know the latency problem. Think we have even more players, like one more player over here, that is player two and player three. Now we know the latency problem. So one way to solve that is, why are we you know, introducing a server in the middle? Okay, what if these players are somewhere nearby or playing from the same place or somewhere nearby? So. What if the latency between these players are a lot lesser? Say, for example, what if the latency between player one and player two is uh, something like 10 milliseconds? Why don't we connect these two players directly? And also, what if player two and, uh, sorry, this will be player three and this will be player four. What if the latency between player two and player four is about 20 milliseconds? Or between these is about, again, 10 milliseconds? Why don't we just let these players, which the game they have installed on their phones or the tablets or the PCs, talk to the other players directly, like peer-to-peer -peer connection, and then play. Yes, that is possible, and some of the games are doing that way. But the problem is you can't trust these players, okay? These might work faster, and these might be simpler, and you don't need server to play. But the problem is you can't trust these players. Why? What if this particular player has hacked this particular game and has understood the game, or he has built some automation like say Selenium or some scripting 
to use the uh, control the game character over here and then so do some kind of uh, um, updates or they can even teleport a character from a given location say if the location of a particular character is at 1 comma 1 uh, in a matrix you can update the code or the script which is running in his phone to suddenly jump it to something like 100 comma 100 that is like if if i was playing normally i should have hit 100 times the up arrow or the left or the navigation uh, buttons but in this case just because he hacked the player has teleported to 100 comma 100 just like that so what happens is for everyone, this player will jump immediately from 1, 1 to 100, 100. And that is bad. The, the total you know, multiplayer gaming experience will be ruined just because of one player has done some kind of hacking to the game client and then he's driving um, the character crazily. So to stop all of this, we obviously need a guy who manages monitors or authoritative um, guy who sits uh, in between these players uh, to validate uh, what's happening in the game. So we need a server and this server is called as authoritative server. Okay, What this server does is, he's the guy who connects all the players, he's like a hub uh, who connects all these players together and then he holds the uh, session information or the maximum number of players can be played in the game. You can't just let one lakh people play PUBG in, in an island. See, because they'll be like crowded, okay? We don't even have a you know, proper gaming experience. So PUBG on an island, it will only allow up to 100 or 150. I don't know the exact number. So that number seems fair. Even if you are designing something, you should be having a hard limit of how many players will be playing on a given map. So that these are all the things you can handle on these authoritative server. We need this server, okay? What this server also does is he will be running a copy of the same game which everyone is running on their devices. So he will be having the same game engine which is running in the authoritative server. Say, suppose this player moved from 1, 1 to instead of moving to 100, 100. So he moves to 1, 2. That means that this state information will be sent to the authoritative server and here in this game engine, which is running in the authoritative server, it updates the player to move from 1, 1 to 1, 2. Only when the acknowledgement or only when the update happens here, this state will be replicated to all the other players. And the player two in these um, games or in these particular devices will be updated to 1, 2. And these authoritative action will be taken by this guy, okay, this server. If he does some hacking, okay, from uh, moving this player from 1, 1 to 100, 100, this authoritative server will try to replicate the same input, input given. Say, for example, he gives uh, like some editing, okay, he does some editing um, in the game script or something, and then he tried to move here. But ideally, we know in our game engine that it is not possible because at any given point of time, if he presses the up arrow or something, he can just fly from 1, 1 to 100. So he knows that at any given point, he can just move one step ahead. So he will, instead of uh, updating the authoritative server, instead of updating the player to from 1, 1 to 100, 100, he will just update to 1, 2 because he knows that it is impossible. And the same... Uh, event or the the position of player two will be sent to everyone. Even though this guy sees that his player has moved to 100, 100, but others will be seeing the player in cut position. And also the games will have intelligence that even though some uh, something like this happens, uh, with the response which it gets from the authority to server, it will come back to 1, 2. Okay, and that is the reason why we need server in between. Now let's learn how to deal with the network. So if you want to send information from point A to point B or play room to play two, how do we send it more efficiently or how do we optimize the bandwidth so that the information can be sent much faster from player one to player two? And what are the strategies? So deterministic lockstep is a method of networking between two computers in which 
we only send the inputs which controls the system. So no more, I know nothing more information. We just send only the inputs which controls that particular game. Say for example, um, so we have two parties, okay? So the player one and we have player two or we have the server. Okay, you can think of player two or server. So we just want to send this information from player one to player two, okay? Now, what does deterministic lockstep say? Says, instead of sending this particular player's orientation, position, or anything like that, just send the input given to this particular player or the player who is playing this particular game. And you just need to send the information like, did the user or the, did the gamer or the player one press the up arrow space or any other controls or the mouse click or something. So you just need to send that information over the internet or over the network to the server or to the other player. So that way the information which we are sending or transmitting from um, player one to player two is a lot minimal. It just says whether this particular key was pressed or not. In that information we can also encode in just bits okay consider this bit represents up arrow this bit represents down arrow this left this right this is space bar say this is a this is s d like that okay so each bit we can include basically like with 26 bits we can include all the alphabetical orders with another 10 bits you can include special characters with another 10 we can include all the different kind of key combinations like up down page up page up right so it comes around just a couple of bytes like how much like five bytes five bits is nothing when we are transmitting data between uh, two parties over the network we can just send this data a lot faster okay and quicker so the advantage is we are sending very small chunk of data between these parties and that's much faster. Otherwise, we should have sent um, state, orientation, position at which the particular uh, game character is standing and everything. And that is hard and that takes a lot of bandwidth because we need to send X, Y direction and all the other uh, you know, characters, say if there's a grass around or if there's a tree or if there's uh, something else, right? So we need to send all the positions. So instead of doing that, if we send only the inputs given to this particular system, we can actually simulate the same environment on the other side. So if you apply this input to the same player two over there, it just um, updates all the other objects around it based on its interaction with the system. In this demo, which this cube is doing rolls and gems and all the other sort of trick, okay? In this case, um, this simulation um, is built using deterministic lockstep and the simulation on the left is uh, controlled by the player and the simulation on the right is um, the input which was sent from left player to the right player over the network okay and um, and the network delay was about uh, two seconds just to show you guys that how deterministic lockstep will work okay um, so if you see so the information sent between left to the right was only the state of keys that affected the simulation on the left side. And also in this demo, uh, the data which was sent from the left side exactly uh, sent to the right side, which also includes the frame information, which um, is necessary to um, simulate the inputs given by the left player. And we need to simulate the same way in, for the right player also. Okay, and uh, how frequently we need to do, keep on uh, sampling these inputs given to the system. Suppose in this case, we are sampling about 60 times per second. Now, you just saw the uh, demo for the deterministic lockstep. It might work in a very good environment or very good network without any delays or packet drops or lags. But I'll tell you uh, some of the scenarios where it won't work. We use TCP. Uh, connection between player one and player two. So any input which we send is all sent as a package, right? Okay. What if for some reason, like, okay, what if the bandwidth was very less in between when the package is going to the P2? In this case, these packets might get delayed. In that case, this player one will wait. Um, the information for the player one will 
not be arrived at the exact time or for exact frame. Player 2 will be playing anyway, but the player 1's data is, hasn't yet arrived. So in that case, this player will be like going in steps, something like that. So that's not a good experience. By using TCP, we are um, incorporating certain lag and jitter. How I will explain. And also the second solution what we can use is play out delay buffer, okay? I'll explain player of buffer first and then we'll go in depth on how we can remove TCP and then use something else to make this um, you know, sending the data and moving the player smoothly. So first, um, let's talk about player buffer. So if you see YouTube or Netflix, um, they're also the same problem, right? Every uh, video frame or um, the data to the video will be sent over the packet. In that case, uh, if there is a lag or uh, if there is a packet drop or if there is a bandwidth issue, then you will see that the video is buffering. To stop that, what these guys do, does is they will preload 10 seconds of video or about five seconds of video preload, and then they will start to play. That way you always have five seconds of video in the buffer. Even if the packet is getting delayed by one second or because of some reason, you will never see that lag or some kind of um, you know buffering or something like that. So the same thing we can do in gaming also. What we can do is, um, so we know that in our from our previous explanation, we know that we at most take about 200 millisecond. If I send a packet here, ideally we will see what, um, you know, 200 millisecond. But for some time, some packets might take more than this or less than that also. So how do we incorporate player buffer? What we do is on the other side, on the player two side, we'll have a buffer. We will save these packets, okay, for 50 millisecond. So we are adding extra 50 millisecond and that's fine to give better experience. So we will park all these packets with just saved um, up to 50 millisecond. That way we have enough data to smoothly move this player without having any jitter or lag. So we will have a buffer on the player to side and we will park for 50 millisecond and then we'll play the, or we will simulate the player. Um, okay, so now the total lag is 250 millisecond. And that's fine, we are sacrificing 50 millisecond for you know, seamless experience. And that's what it is called as player for. And the second one is TCP connection. So the problem with the TCP connection is, say for example, I have these four packets. So this was packet one, packet two, packet three and packet four, okay? Now packet one arrived, say consider I sent packet one. Packet one arrived at the P2, okay? All good, so we can simulate something. Packet two, for some reason packet two was dropped or somehow this packet two was lost. But packet three and packet four is available because TCP ensures that the packets arrive at an order and it is reliable it won't allow you to access three and four until this packet is retransmitted from P1 back to P2. That means that to access the, this data, somehow this guy should learn by the acknowledgement sent by P2 and then it should know that P2 was lost and then he should send. It will take a lot of extra time. So what happens is when um, we send acknowledgement for one and we also send for acknowledgement three, uh, even though we are not able to access the system will send acknowledgement. That's when it learns that acknowledgement for packet 2 was not received. So he will retransmit packet 2. Okay, so when the packet 2 is received, that's when we receive the packet 2 and then we receive packet 3 and packet 4. So it took, you know, round trip time, total round trip time, okay, like going back the acknowledgement and then the retransmitting packet 2. It you know, about 400 milliseconds more to receive this particular packet. So our player here was stuck for 400 milliseconds just because one packet was dropped. Even though we have four and three packets available, we couldn't do anything because packet two was lost. So let's don't use TCP. Then what are the other options we can use? Why don't we try UDP protocol? So UDP, as you know, it's not connection-oriented protocol and it is not reliable. 
and it doesn't send acknowledgement or something like that. The header size of uh, UDP is also less. That way, we will save something on bandwidth. Okay. Um, yeah. UDP is functionless. TCP is function oriented. So we have to leverage UDP. So let's see how we can use UDP to make our gaming experience better. Okay. So consider at time t, p uh, one or one, we have input one. At time two, we have input two, and at time three, we have input three. So how do we send the data reliably over UDP? Since UDP doesn't send acknowledgments back and it is unreliable and it is connectionless, how do we uh, send this data so that we won't lose any of the data? So the trick is, instead of just sending, okay, we have, if it was TCP, we would have had three different packets and uh, just for a representation purpose. Um, and we would have sent the data. So in each packet, we used to send, you know, input one, input two, input three, something like that. But in case of UDP, since we don't know how many packets will be lost or something like that, so deliberately include more information. Say, so this packet, first packet will have I1, that is input one, so it is sent. Uh, I'll write it over here. So first packet, I1. And the second packet, so instead of having just I2, we'll have I1 and I2. So we have, you know, redundant information. In the third packet, so say we have I2, and I3. So that way, uh, same maybe I1 also. So in that way, even if these two packets are dropped, we still get this data packet and we have all the input we can reconstruct. With every input, we also have captured, uh, you know, timestamp or the sequence number of the input. Say we also have timestamp, also have sequence number, timestamp two, timestamp three, we have a different, different sequence number. Based on the timestamps and the sequence number, we can recreate or we will easily know that, okay, this input was supposed to be recreated at this time or this, this frame or this order. So that way we can make this player move smoothly in, the, in, in this particular view. Even though these packets are dropped, we can still access this packet and no need to retranspect these packets back. Even though we have some mechanism uh, to understand and retranspect, we don't need to wait to access this data, um, unlike TCP. So that way we can make things better. And here is the demo in which um, you can see these cubes, um, you know, simulated using UDP. So unlike uh, the last demo, which was on TCP, which had only 5% packet loss and 250 millisecond delay. But this demo is having about 25% packet loss and also we have incorporated two second delay. So the data which is sent from the left to right is having a delay of about two second and there is about 25% packet loss. Even though you can see how beautifully we were able to simulate uh, you know, exactly the way uh, the data was there in the left side, uh, we were able to simulate on the right side. So, so far we learned deterministic lockstep. Deterministic lockstep works, but the only problem is the input from the player one and player two or vice versa should be properly synced, okay? If we screw up in the timing or syncing, the simulation varies. If we vary the simulation at any given frame, the total simulation of the environment will go for a toss. The simulation will never match with player one and player two because we screwed up in one input, even though if we delay it by a couple of milliseconds, the total simulation of the environment will differ. Say for example, this particular image, right? So this is the end result of the deterministic log step. If you see the cubes are little, um, they're not matching. The scene, the player one scene, and the player two scene are not matching because the cubes are little, um, cubes are not properly arranged, right? So what are the other possibilities in which we can sync the data between players more efficiently and uh, it lessens our worry about syncing the exact information at a given specific time intervals and without losing any of the simulation, you know, without causing any of the simulation differences between players. So one possible way is using state synchronization. And as the name says, we actually synchronize the state of each and every object in the, you know, particular games itself or the objects which are affected by that particular player, okay? So how does this work? So in this case, every object uh, uh, in the game is kind of uh, actual object of a class, right? So 
So we just need to sync the data, like position, orientation, linear velocity, and angular velocity, color, or any of its feature characteristics. So all that kind of data we need to keep on synchronized between different players. So that way, at any given point of time, we know, even though we have lost all the data for, for the past data, we can, with the existing state information, we can just recreate the scene um, using that state information of each and every object. In this case, even though we have lost, consider we have lost all the data from the previous, if I know the state information of each and every small cubes and the state information of the big cube, uh, I can just read that state information and I can recreate the you know scene uh, easily. I know this cube was supposed to be in this position and this small cube was supposed to be flying and this cube was supposed to be oriented this way and placed in this particular position. That way, state synchronization is very better. We can correct the game scene at any given point of time. The only problem is, if you see, each object will have these much, this much data. And all this data is kind of integers and uh, different data types, right? So each state will have KBs or you know, at least some bytes of data. So in case of um, deterministic lock step, we are just sending input data. It used to be in bytes, right? Now we are dealing with kilobytes per object. So the data would be in terms of MBs, you know, at any given point of time, the data will be, the bandwidth which we required, it will be in terms of like 15 megabytes per second or 20 MB per second like that. But um, that is without some other tricks applied. Something like quantization and compression. If you use these tricks uh, on uh, the state information, we can actually compress this data into KBPS. And now you might be thinking, since we have state synchronization, we have each and every object's state and we will not have any other problems. But it's not like that way. Even though we have the uh, you know state information of each and every object and we are synchronizing the state, we will have jitters and lagging problem. Um, so you know why? Say for example, we are sending the state as, you know information every uh, you know 60 times a second that is like almost like 60 times a second, still we will have the jitter. Um, so how do we solve? We have to some have some kind of prediction. By using the existing state of the player, say, say suppose we have a car which is running and we are syncing the state information of the car 60 times a second. Still, we have this uh, lagging um, because of the connection bandwidth issues or that gap between the 60th, one by 60th of a second, we will see that jitter, right? The car moves in steps, but um, that's not good. So how do we make this car move a lot smoother um, without having, you know, without this car taking steps where, as and when we sync the state information? How do we do that? For that, we need to kind of have some kind of prediction. How can we predict? Say, for example, if a car is having, um, you know, linear velocity or the acceleration, data available in that particular car's object state, we can kind of, you know, predict for the next uh, one by 60th seconds, um, you know, moment, okay? So if the car is traveling at 100 km per second, uh, you know, 100 km per hour, in that case, we can somehow move the car for another one by 60th of the second without even we receiving the data from the other end. So we kind of somehow predicting how this object or particular player might behave uh, with the previous information or historical information we have so far. And uh, there are so many tricks or different kind of techniques on how we can predict the player's movement. Now, let's learn how do we handle game state, okay? Um, for this example, in this clip, if you see, uh, everything is an object. I have already told you, a player, grass, a bomb, a fire, a truck, a gun, everything is an object. So every object actually takes some kind of input. It's all physics, right? Um, every object takes some kind of input, a force or any input, and then it should also respond uh, for that input. That And also sometimes these objects will um, update the state of other objects. So there is a lot of dependency. Basically, if uh, for simplicity, we can um, take it as it takes input, it also updates the state and also it behaves something. So there are a couple of actions happening here. Say for example, a player, um, so there is something like Mario, 
and there is you know mario okay um standing on the floor so now uh, just for the simplicity sake how difficult it is to handle suppose if i press up arrow this mario mario should jump okay say he will be here so he is in the jumping state now now what are the possible cases uh, we should handle at this state is if a player presses up arrow again he shouldn't be jumping again and again because that's not how uh, uh, any you know person or a player behaves he, he can't fly right because he doesn't have wing or if he presses the down arrow he can't just drop it like that he should be normally landing at some projection right um and also um when he's on the air if you press space bar maybe he he shouldn't be ducking or should be like acting like he is sitting so uh, we shouldn't be allowing further jam he should we shouldn't be allowing him to sit um or he shouldn't be uh, he can fire but he, he can fire from air right so that is allowed he can fire so there are different complex um, if and else right so if he is jumping we can't make him jump again if he is jumping we can't make him sit if he is jumping it's okay to allow to fire so there are different kind of combination in any given state when he is standing on the floor so there's a lot of ifs are there okay so um so so basically what i'm trying to say is um there are a lot of scenarios to handle how do you do that one probability what we can do is a uh, very simple lame kind of coding is if and else is something like which i'm showing on the screen right now so, so it show it has handled a lot of different scenarios okay um if the key pressed is b and once again we are checking if he is uh, jumping and if he is not ducking sorry if it is not jumping and if he is not ducking only then we can or we are allowed to allow we are allowing the player to jump if else what we're doing is if he is pressing down arrow if he and inside if he is not jumping then only we will allow him to duck so similarly we have tons of conditions this way the code doesn't look neater we have to uh, and it is not maintainable and it doesn't follow any kind of design pattern so how do we solve this problem if you carefully observe um this um explanation which i have explained um every time a player is in particular state now he is in standing state and he is in jumping state and he is landing okay uh, so there are, there are different state he is like standing state and he is jumping state okay so you are hearing a lot of word you know word called as state 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 that actually kind of should give you a clue that we should have some kind of state machine so every player at every given point of time should have its own state say take myself okay i'm standing so i'm in a state which is in standing if i am um, swimming i'll be in a state where it is swimming okay in each state we can define their own possibility of actions and that way it is a lot easier to model um, the state of any given player it looks something like this okay um so to explain further a better approach um is to use state machine right and each state is defined in its own classes um state pattern is a behavioral software design pattern that implements a state machine in object oriented way and how do we implement this state machine of our state you know pattern so for that first we need to have a interface okay this is called as a player state in which it defines handle input and also it defines update okay um these are the two methods as i already mentioned every object should take some input and it should behave or should update the state of other objects which are um you know surrounding to it okay so that way so for simplicity we are just defining two different methods in the interface so every state in here should implements its own classes in this case maybe uh, you know standing state will have its own um class and the class looks something like this okay and now we have all the different kind of states now how do we delegate the state for that we'll have to build a player okay a player is also again um class 
we can create as many players we want by instantiating this particular class. And each um, player will have its own state. Um, so when the game starts, maybe by default the player is standing. So we will assign the state equals to standing state. And further, when the game progresses, um, the state will change based on the input given to that particular uh, player and how he reacts to the environment. And that's how we should be implementing using state pattern. And um, I think I have pretty much covered a lot about how uh, we should think uh, from the game client perspective. And um, in the next video, we will learn how from the backend, uh, how do we handle all of these different scenarios or state update or how do we load balance? How do we make users join and play games seamlessly? So if you like this video, please subscribe to my channel. This actually helps and encourages me to produce uh, a lot of system design videos. Um, and uh, please tell your friends uh, to subscribe to this channel. And if you have any suggestion, please do write comments. And also, if you like this video, please tell me um, what I can uh, also improve in my videos. Thank you.